This is Andrew Stotts of A. Stotts Investment Research talking about value model. And in this case, I'm looking at IAH Healthcare in Malaysia. Today's topics is going to be a little background on the company, some forecasts, absolute valuation, relative valuation, and sensitivity. Now, for the disclaimer, this example was created on the 1st of March, 2017. What follows is not evaluation, forecast rating, or recommendation. Rather, it's a teaching example. What follows is not investment advice. Rather, it's a teaching example. It is intended only as academic information for those who want to learn about valuation. It should not be construed as a basis for any valuation or investment. And the information in the presentation came from various sources which we believe are reliable, though we do not guarantee the accuracy, adequacy, or completeness of such information. Hey, I hope you enjoy learning about valuation as much as I do, so let's get on with it. Now, IHH Healthcare is a prominent healthcare service provider in Asia, Central and Eastern Europe, Middle East, and North Africa. It's the second largest listed healthcare operator in the world by market cap. With more than 30,000 employees globally, IHH operates across 10 countries and has close to 10,000 beds and 52 hospitals. The company has three subsidiaries, Park, Parkway, Pantai, Asi, Badam, and International Medical University. Parkway, Pantai is the group's major subsidiary. It is spread across Singapore, Malaysia, Brunei, India, and China, being the largest private health care provider in Singapore and the second largest in Malaysia. IHH holds a 35% stake in Parkway Life, a healthcare real estate investment trust with 49 properties and a 10% stake in Apollo Hospitals, a broad network of facilities mostly in India. Here we can see the revenue breakdown with 61% coming from Parkway, the main contributor. So now let's look at the forecast and in this case what we can see is the company has a revenue growth rate about 9, 15, and then 21. Now we always want to be careful when a company is in an acceleration phase because that may not continue forever. In fact, look at the net profit growth. It went from 19.5 to 24 to 56. That's massive and we can see that the net margin has increased up to 14. So if we just blindly forecast that forward, we could end up with a 20% net profit margin by the time we get to the this point right here in 2021. But I think we have to be careful, look at competitors, and try to understand what type of profit margin is sustainable for the business. And so here, forecast is that growth will slow slightly and that net margin will come down slightly to about 12.4. Now... Let's look at the balance sheet and the assets of the balance sheet. And we can see that this company, we're expecting asset growth. It's a bit lumpy. Asset growth is always lumpy. And then in this case, we're forecasting that asset growth is going to fall quite substantially down to 3.7. And that's, sorry, that's the net fixed assets. And that's the, the hospitals and other investments that they're making. And the total assets is going to be about 7 to 6 to 7%. I like to look at the revenue per asset and we can see that it's been rising here and I expect it to rise slightly going forward. If we look at the liabilities of the company, we can see that the dividend payout ratio of the company is about going up to about 33 from 24 or so percent. And <clears throat> if we look at the cash flow statement, what we're going to see is... Uh, we're going to see that operating cash flow is very strong. CapEx is going to continue to be high. And the net working capital is a small investment item for the company. So now let's look at the next uh, subject, which is the absolute valuation we get from these forecasts. So sorry about that. I can't figure out how to get rid of that line. Let me see if I can do that by deleting that. Nope, that didn't work. Oh, yeah, it did. Okay, great. Oh, and it comes back. Don't know how. So now what we're going to look at is the important items for me that I look at is the NOPAT, what are our forecasts, and what are the forecasts going into the fade period. And you can see that that's fading down right there from a very high level. And I look at the amount of CapEx, which we looked at in the cash flow statement, and the change in working capital. 
those are the major items. And from that, I can see that free cash flow of the firm has been rising and that I think it will rise further. And, but eventually that free cash flow to the firm will start to slow down and even start to fade, which we'll look at in a second. So return on invested capital has gone from 11 to 14 to 15. So the company is growing its capital, invested capital slowly compared to its profit growth. I don't see a reason why that can't continue for a while, but eventually in the fade period, it's going to come back down. So now if we look at it, we can see that the growth rate in the EPS is let's say seven to 12 or 13%. And the growth rate in dividends per share is going to be slightly higher in this year because we're increasing and then increasing and then increasing. So that will drive strong dividend per share growth. So now let's look at the cost of capital assumptions and the cost of capital assumptions. We'll see that um, the main thing here is the equity risk premium estimate that we've that based upon dividend discount model is about 8%. And based upon survey results, I wrote Hong Kong, that was a mistake, sorry about that. It's uh, actually about seven is what I'm gonna estimate for, now remember always that this is from now until eternity. So we have to be careful about the assumptions that we make. We don't wanna make too extreme assumptions or else we're gonna have extreme values. So the end result of this is that I'm gonna pick a beta of about 0.75 and that's gonna give me a cost of equity of about 9%. Now there is a 20% tax rate. The company gets some tax yield when it borrows money, but it doesn't borrow much, about 15%. So the weighted average cost of capital is pretty close right there. And <clears throat> now if we look at the fade, what I'm doing is saying there's gonna be a five year fade period. And what I'm gonna say is that the return on invested capital is gonna fade down to the cost, the weighted average cost of capital. So there is no premium or discount. And then the terminal value growth rate is about 3%. And if we wanna go and see that fade, we can see it right here as this line is fading down, the bar is fading down, that's the no pad, and profitability is fading down. So now let's take a look at what we find from absolute valuation. And what we see from this is a range of values from 1.6 all the way up to 4.3. And <clears throat> most of the value is in the terminal value for the dividend discount model. But if we look at free cash flow to equity or free cash flow to the firm, it's less so. So now let's look at relative valuation. And what we can see is that PE is what you pay in price for one in earnings. And it is a simple and commonly used measure. We compare a company against its sector in its country, its region, and its sector worldwide. Now, the company's 2017 EPS times the country's PE in 2017 for the healthcare sector gives a value of 7.6. So we did have absolute values of 1.6, 2.2, and 4.3, and now we just come up with 7.6. That's pretty massive, right? Well, we can see that the uh, PE ratio is about 40 times for the industry. So we're saying if we take this type of calculation, we're saying that there would be a re-rating. Well, why would there be a re-rating when the profit growth is higher for the industry? These are questions that you'd want to answer as you go through your valuation. So now let's move on to the price to book valuation, which is especially useful for firms where assets are the core driver for earnings or where earnings are volatile. Now the price to book multiple of Malaysia's healthcare sector for 2017 times the company's 2017 book value per share results in a value of 6.95. So now we can round that up and say PE relative values, we've got 7.6 and 7.0 and the absolute values are much less here. Now the current price is 6.2. So the relative value estimates indicate that this stock might be cheap but the absolute value rec uh, valuations show that this stock may be expensive. So there's a lot to look at from an analyst perspective that we may adjust and go in deeper on this to try to understand the discrepancy. Now let's just look at the sensitivity for a moment. And again, I look at sensitivity about sales growth, about gross margin, and then I look at discount rate and terminal growth to try to understand about the sensitivity. And what we can see is that EPS growth can be impacted. now the gross margin of this company is very high. So, but even a small change we can see of plus or minus 5% can cause the EPS to go from 
up to 20.8 to 5.6 on the downside. But what we can see is that the range of values <clears throat> is pretty stable. Now, peg ratio is one I always watch for. That's a little bit tricky because it's a very volatile measure. So from this, we can get a picture of what will happen when we change the different factors. When we change the uh, discount rate, we can see very little change. So, you know, maybe we could widen this a little bit and see what that would cause. And then the terminal growth rate provides pretty little change from that. So there you have it. That's IHH Healthcare. And I hope you could learn from that. Have a great day.